I, yeah, I'm going to assume some of this matches up because there is one of the state law too, section 4301 1-C. I think it's back to same definition. I can actually look it up right now on my phone. Well, that would go to the back of the book. Right, right. I was reading it earlier. Um, Okay, call the meeting to order. Um, what we got here, Jack. Did you hear from anyone, Chip? Nobody. Nobody? Okay. Who's... Henry wrote that he wasn't coming. Who's Charles Kettleman? Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Henry. Henry won't be here. Um, he said he was going to try to stay in New York City, but yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Um, well, we have um, a single item on the agenda tonight, um, and hopefully, we'll be able to finish working through the LD two thousand three changes. And um, later on, we'll see, you know, where that discussion takes us, but um, we should be talking about a potential hearing date and so forth, but we can save that for the end of the meeting. Um, so Jamal is with us tonight, and he has also brought um, Charles uh, Tiedelman, um, who is a new planner at North Star. And so Jamal, why don't you, why don't you take it and make your introductions and so forth at this point? Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. I'm Jamel Torres, as you guys know. Um, I work for North Star Planning, been helping you guys with the LD 2003 work. Um, and Charles Tettleman um, has been with North Star for oh, almost two months now. And um, he brings a lot of experience um, with development review and ordinance revisions. Um, he actually used to work with KV Cog. Um, a few years back, and I think he actually has worked with the uh, Reed Field Planning Board on some projects. Um, so I think Charles is just going to tune in for a little while tonight. Um, the plan for the future is for Charles to take more of a lead on Reed Field projects as they come along. Um, any other future planning projects, I think Charles will be your your planner, um, and I'll I'll also be available as well. But um, Charles really wanted to work with you all, so I just wanted to introduce him tonight. Um, and I don't know, I don't want to put him on the spot, but um, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Charles, and uh, before you log off for the night. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's great to be back uh, working with Reedfield. I know that we worked on the comp plan a little bit when I was at KV Cog, so I see some familiar faces in the room. So I'm looking forward to getting back into uh, the swing of it with Reedfield. So. Thanks. Okay. Nice to see you, Charles. Okay. So, um, Jamel and I talked a little bit earlier today. We went through some of the revisions to the ordinance language and um, agreed that we would, um, you know, approach this rather informally and try to work through and discuss 
each of the, the revisions that's been proposed. And um, um, first of all, I need to apologize for my, my uh, formatting and uh, <laughs> mess. It was, it was horrific and I didn't realize it until the morning after I sent it. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully you can make some sense of that. Um, one thing that will need to happen um, after we finish with this meeting and finish going through the draft is to produce a finished draft in legislative format that will go to public hearing. So um, we will, you know, clean it up, put it into um, underlined strikeout form, and uh, distribute it to everybody again. So you know, you'll have another look at it before we take it anywhere. Um, so Jamel had sent um, our meeting in January, we had some discussion about various provisions in the ordinance. Um, Jamel made some modifications and sent that out. Um, and I took that and had a few additional uh, suggested revisions and edits uh, to what Jamel had done, which is what I sent out um, a few days ago. And, um, you know, I'm thinking maybe the best way to go through it is to do what we did last time, just um, go through it piece by piece. And, um, you know, we can come back to certain provisions. There's some overlap and there are some linkages between some of the sections. So we can, we can go back and forth as necessary. But um, um, generally, um, what I had sent out was in two pieces. Um, one is the reorganization of Article 8. Um, I had mentioned at the last meeting that I thought that it would be helpful to do that for several different reasons, and this was my, um, my attempt to, um, uh, to reorganize it and produce a section that deals solely with dwelling units and all their various um, forms. And uh, one thing that happened, um, I did send a second email out, uh, which hopefully you saw, but um, <clears throat> I had intended um, in, in Jamel's package, there was a page that modified the multifamily dwelling section. And my intent had been to delete um, all of the new language because those concepts have been moved into the new reorganized section one. So that was page seven of, of Jamel's draft. And um, those deletions did not show up in my draft, but uh, that was the intent here. Um, so my, my basic thought in doing the reorganization was that um, I, I remained concerned about uh, putting all of the discussion about affordable housing and the dwelling unit density bonus into the multifamily dwelling piece. Um, it didn't seem um, a good fit to me. And so I've arranged this so that multifamily dwellings, which have their own you know, small set of standards um, remains a subsection onto itself. And then there is a separate section that addresses affordable housing and the density bonus. Um, so much of the new section one would stay the same, uh, two family dwellings, conversion or reconstruction, multifamily. And then <clears throat> there's the um, insertion of four new pieces. Um, I included in A, single family dwellings, it seemed as though, you know, if we're going to talk about all the other types of dwelling units, there should be something in here about single family. So um, there's nothing, nothing radical in there, but I just thought it should be included. And then um, the, in E, the multiple dwelling units allowed, that is one of the provisions of LD 2003 that we had talked about. Um, F is affordable housing and the density bonus, and G uh, is accessory dwelling units. And the language on that appears later in the package, and I, I marked that up as well. Um, so that's the, um, 
basic overview of the, the reorganized section. And um, um, oh, one other thing I'd mention about this is that if you look at um, F, the affordable housing development piece, um, two things about it specifically. When Jamel and I talked about this uh, earlier today, um, um, we both agreed that F1 uh, probably would more appropriately reference growth areas rather than the um, specific districts that have been designated as growth areas. And Jamel's thought, and, and I agree completely, is that if in the future the comprehensive plan changed what the growth areas are, if we just generally reference those growth areas, we wouldn't have to come back and revise the ordinance in that respect. Um, so um, I'm going to suggest something like uh, the development must be located in an area designated as a future growth area in the town of Reedfield's most recent comprehensive plan. Well, this is a, this is a trivial point in drafting, but if we were going to try to avoid having to amend this in the future, wouldn't it really say, as designated in, in the, current, the current version of the comprehensive plan or in any subsequent revision to the comprehensive yeah, plan? Yeah, we can say that. Or the, so that we wouldn't have to amend. Yeah. Our own, yeah. the most recently approved. That would bring you. Oh, well, I had a question. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between Article Eight, Section One D, multi multifamily dwellings, which is in our current ordinance, and E, multiple dwelling units allowed? What's really the difference between the two? The multifamily dwellings is the language that's been in the ordinance, you know, for for quite some time, and it talks about um, uh, what the standards are for building a new multifamily dwelling, um, which can't be more than four units, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the multiple dwelling units allowed is that new piece in two thousand three um, that says that you can build more than one dwelling unit on a lot, but you have to have sufficient land area for that second lot. So if the minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet, you can build multiple units on your lot, but you, each one of them has to have that 20,000. And when we talked about this before, um, we had had some discussion and I think agreed ultimately that this provision doesn't change anything in our ordinance. We already require that. Right. So why? And, and why so I, well, I, I included it. Um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but I included it because I wanted it to be clear that it acknowledges, you know, the new Title 30A language. Right. and expresses it in terms of LD 2003, in case there was ever any question about whether or not the town is compliant with it. It just seemed it might be advantageous to make it clear. So there's no there's no real difference between the two sections, just... Now there's a difference between those two sections, but there's no difference. When you look at the multiple dwelling units allowed, we already right. allow that. Right. The ordinance, uh, you have to dig for it, but but it is it is allowed. Um, I don't question what you just said about how this um, is it what's intended. It's not really going to change anything as, as far as multiple dwelling units and lot size. But I still don't understand though is what the intent of the legislature was when they said when they enacted section forty forty three sixty four dash a subsection one, shall allow structures with up to two dwelling units per lot. That, that's where I can't, I can't, I thought the, I thought the intent of the legislature was to um, 
increase to mandate an increase in density, allowable density. So yeah. I was confused. Um, somewhere in this piece in the guidance, it got into that. Um, Want me to jump in? This is per lot, per lot, right? I can jump in if you guys want. Yeah, if you would, Jamal, please. Yeah, so in the guidance document, the idea is basically that there are a lot of communities in Maine that only allow one dwelling unit per lot um, in their land use laws. So this provision essentially requires municipalities to allow for more than that um, and anywhere where housing is allowed. I think that's at its most basic level, that's what the intention is. So by that, can, can we mandate that they have twice the area? Well, the argument that, by the way, the argument that we could is that in subsection 3 of section 4364-A, which says, after it says that you can, that you can't establish dimensional requirements, including setbacks that are more, um, that are more uh, restrictive, it says, except except that a municipal ordinance may establish requirements for a lot area per dwelling unit, as long as the required lot area for subsequent units on a lot is not greater than the required lot area for the first unit. Okay. Yeah. And so. Interesting. Uh, I tried to look at the legislative history actually Got a, I have a copy and I have an entire legislative history on my computer. Lucky you. And then she, I got from the law, law library, state law library, yeah. lucky me, right. And that wasn't the original draft. That provision I just read wasn't the original draft. I, I suspect it was uh, part of a political compromise in response to some of the objections to the original draft. So what's the change then? What does it do? Um, well, for these, for this particular issue, I'd say it does nothing. It it doesn't it doesn't there's there's a piece in our existing ordinance. I know what ordinance says. Oh, but this changed it. Like, it does it. not. <clears throat> so, you know, one place in the existing ordinance that this is addressed is. Um, in Article 7, Section 6, and that's the dimensional table. Um, the introductory paragraph before that table says, if more than one dwelling unit or other principal structure or use or combination thereof is constructed or established on a single lot, all dimensional requirements for land area and frontage shall be met for each additional dwelling unit, principal structure, or use. And I mean, that's existing language. And that's why I say that this this new thing doesn't change anything because that's, you know. But except for you all units. That's different. That is different. Right. Um, so the one the one other thing that I wanted to mention about F, the affordable housing development piece, is that um in the in the law and in the DECD rule, uh, there's a lot of verbiage about what an affordable housing development is and and what the the standards are to qualify as an affordable housing development. And when I looked at that, there were two places um, in in the ordinance now where we need to address that. One is here in in Article. Um, Article 8, and 
It's the standard that requires the owner of, of an affordable housing development to execute a restrictive covenant. And it, um, it states specifically that they have to ensure that for at least 30 years, you know, a couple of different things uh, for rental housing and for owned housing. And that language comes from, it comes from the law, it comes from the DECD rule. And then um, in the context, kind of suggested to me the, you know, the, the right way to put those words together to form it into a requirement for an owner of a housing development. The other thing I did was to pull, it was a big chunk of verbiage that essentially defined affordable housing unit. I pulled that out of the narrative and created a definition of affordable housing development using that language. So it's it's not in the uh, in the piece about affordable housing developments. It's the definition, and um, so that is toward the back. I inserted that in the is definition it, piece on page eleven. Can you remind? Is it half the units have to be available for people with eighty percent of the median yes. income? Is that the standard? Or am I yeah, just... it's um, it's a house. Uh, affordable housing development, a household whose income does not exceed 80% of the area median income uh, as defined by HUD and can afford 51% or more of the units in the development without spending more than 30% of the household's income. Well, that's the other piece. Yeah. And so it didn't seem necessary to me or appropriate really to put all of that into this requirement for the restrictive covenant. So that's the difference between the two in my mind. I think that was fine. I, just as a comment, nothing to change. I don't know why the people who drafted the statute used the term restrictive covenant. It's a terrible, it's got a terrible history that term. Uh, they should have said enforcement covenant. But anyway, it is what it is. To, um, is it is it clear that the subdivision provisions apply in this section? I mean, I know it says that you have to meet all other applicable requirements in this ordinance, but should should it be clear to add that you know, including the subdivision uh, it, provisions? You know, I I think. Jamel, is it in the DECD rule? Um, somewhere there is a specific reference and it says that this section, you know, doesn't get you out of the subdivision standards if there are some. And it might be worth including it specifically. I think you could argue that they're still subject to it, but it might be worth including it specifically, taking that DECD language and putting it in there. Right. Um, what do you think about that, Jamel? I think the clearer you can be, the better for an ordinance. Um, but yeah, anything three or more units would trigger subdivision. So typically, if they're going to take advantage of the density bonus, they're probably going to do three or more units. Um, so it, it it doesn't hurt, but it it is a requirement um, either way. So it's only the subdivision provision would apply only if you divide the land though, right? Um, build... even, like, even rental units usually trigger subdivision. It's it's any sort of division of of property. Mm. Unless your site plan ordinance um, is stricter or better than your subdivision ordinance. So that's a local policy. So where would we put that? Um, I'd have to take a look at where to put it specifically, but you could put it, um, right after ordinance, including subdivision if, and then you can put the trigger language. Um, but I think that it, you're fine with the way it's written. Um, it covers the entire land use ordinance. So the subdivision ordinance lives within that. So you'd be fine. So, 
Where were you suggesting something specific could go, Jamel? Are you talking about Article 8 in the affordable housing piece? Um, I was actually Where's looking at E by mistake, but yeah, I mean, you could put it, you could do like a three um, in that section, or you could just put any, that would probably be the best place. But again, it's it's a given that it would, that it triggers it. Anytime it's three or more, it would trigger it. So it's it's not a requirement, I would say. It's more for clarity, um, if that's what you desire. Well, I mean, we could include it as a, as a note instead of a standard. Um, yep. Well, I do have a question on the language in F. Yeah. About parking. Yes. Uh, and I know this, this language came out right from the statute, I believe, um, which says are not required to provide more than two off street parking spaces for every three dwelling units. Da, 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 not a problem. Um, I, I struggle with that because it's not really a I mean, it doesn't really say what you don't have to provide more, but it doesn't say what you do have to provide. Um, I guess. I would think that that would be an issue that we would look at during site review. Um, you know, there's a there's a general right, but that, parking but usually standard. somebody's going to the land use ordinance wants to say so. How many parking units, park, parking spaces do I have to provide? And this this is kind of just saying well, the, the town can't require you to provide more than two for every three units, but it doesn't say what we really do require. <laughs> I mean, and so the, how do they know when they come in? Um, it's not the town they're regulating. They're regulating the way a lot of towns regulate out multiple units is saying that you have to have two per unit. And what they're saying is that the multiple plan shouldn't have that, that there should always only be two per unit. Now, where they, where they go? Well, this is saying two for every three units. That's, That's a state what, requirement. It, right. But so what yeah. is our requirement? What's the town of Greenfield's requirement? This is what I'm getting at. I mean, I don't know. I mean, my, my reaction is that our requirement is kind of case specific, I would I would think. Um, so is there another place where we talk about that? It, there is in, there is a parking piece, isn't there a chip in the performance standards? Sorry. Um, I think there was one about a minimum of like two per block per unit or something like that. Yeah, which is why this is in here. I mean, you know, if, if we're talking about an affordable housing development, they can't, you know, we can't require more than that. They might propose it and that would be okay, but the town couldn't force them to do it. So, Chip, do you recall anything? What I'm thinking of is um, there's section 17 and article eight is parking areas. And it talks about determining the appropriate size of proposed parking facilities. And then there's a traffic access piece in section 18. Um, in our article 3B, does also talk about it. We couldn't fill them all. Well, that's where it says the name two parking Pretty strong. Yeah. So, but it, 
but the, that doesn't apply if it's affordable housing, apparently. Right. Right. So that's the that's, that's where. Okay. Um. Do you have a proposed fix for what would make it less confusing? Um, because I mean, you know, if it's a multi-family dwelling and that's all it is, and it comes in for site review, you know, we'd say, yeah, you've got to have two or, mm -hmm. you know. Um, however, that changes theoretically if it's, you know, a, an affordable housing right. development. Right, so, so at the developed. very least, I would think under section 3B, we would want to, Insert something there, say notwithstanding affordable housing units. Three B. Um, I'm looking at your markup on page seven, article eight, three B. I don't have a three B. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. This is the, yeah, this is the, um, this is the, this is the page that went away. Um, it's, this is existing language. Um, So it's um, what's intended to go into um, D in the new article A, if you look at the new outline, yep. that should be existing language. And some of what's on that page that you're looking at is existing language. And I think that part of the language would be part of that. Yes, it is. Yes. So you're you're saying unless it's an affordable housing development. Yeah, it seems like there needs to be some kind some of cross reference. After a quick breeze through of subdivision too, there's a provision for this that has the same amount of parking spaces. Um, let's see, there's there's a required improvements. I believe this is subdivision. Yeah, so it's section twenty F. And then six, it says for each dwelling unit, there shall be off street parking for at least two vehicles. So you could cross reference there as well um, in subdivision if, if desired. As long as it's somewhere though, where people can see it for affordable, should be fine. I stepped out, so it's article eight, section one, two family dwellings, minimum of two on site parking spaces shall be provided for each dwelling unit. Okay. And then multifamily, same thing, minimum yeah. of two on site parking. Okay. Um, That's uh, section three. Yeah, and so. So Don's suggestion was a cross-reference in most locations to just say, and oh, by the way, if you're in affordable housing development, you know, it's a different, it might be a different requirement. Mm -hmm. But. Um, Does it have to be different? I think it would be under the law, the state yeah. statute now. Isn't it three to two now? Instead of two to one, it would 
for affordable unit, affordable developments? Doesn't the statute now say three to two? No, no, I don't think it says three. It, it's, it's, it's like ours where we have two, three, or multiple. It's the same. I don't think you can. Yeah. We we can't require more than two. More two. than two for every three dwelling. Yeah, units. that's what I meant. Yeah. Right. Is that correct? Correct. The applicant could propose more. You know, the applicant right. could say we want 20 spaces for five units based on their programming, but the town can't require that. So they can still build more. You just can't require more, more than two spaces for every three units. And the language that Paul put in there says that. I'm not sure what the difficulty is. You know, I, I think it I think it works without all the cross references, but you know, Don's point was that it might be confusing to someone seeing a different parking space requirement in those other sections. But um, if what they're proposing is a multifamily dwelling, I mean, that's that's where they should be focused. And if they're, you know, if they're proposing an affordable housing development, they would see that different requirement in the language there. Right. But I think, you know, I think we could put a cross reference in and provide some additional clarity. But I think it means that we don't just put it in one place. If we're going to put it in one place, I think we need to put it in four places, like, like four places um, for consistency reasons. We could put it with the subdivision language. <laughs> yeah, there too. Um. And, um, other what else about this section? Other comments? Search, which, which um, section? We're still looking at the article eight stuff. My general comment is I think that this is a, a, an improvement, that this makes it a lot easier for somebody looking at this. So I was glad to see it. Anything else? Anybody? We can come back if you know anything else occurs to you. Um, all right. Um, so why don't we move on? Um, so we're working off what was um, Jamel's redraft, which I made some proposed edits too. So it's kind of a mashup of uh, Jamel's stuff and mine. Um, so page one of that, um, <clears throat> this is where we had talked at the last meeting about adding a piece um, that specifically addresses an increase in not conformity. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, so this is where Jamal inserted that. Um, I modified the language a little bit, but it does, that's what it does basically is acknowledges that there cannot be an increase in not conformity. Um, I looked at this several times and I, I went back to the statute again. So that's 4364-B3C. It says an accessory dwelling unit is allowed on a lot that does not conform to the municipal zoning ordinance if the accessory dwelling unit does not further increase the nonconformity. Traditionally, under our, the way I think our legislature ordinance is phrased, if you were ever adding on 
to a non-conforming structure, you'd be increasing the non-conformity. So I, I'm, uh, what is the, okay. so I'm trying to figure out what, but what is, what is intended by this statement? Um, so the, the DECD rule goes further in, in the section, gosh, I don't know. I'm on page uh, oh, nine of the DECD rule. An accessory dwelling unit must be allowed, according to the rule, on a lot, regardless of whether the lot conforms to existing dimensional requirements of the municipality. But then it says, any new structure cons uh, constructed on the lot to be an accessory dwelling unit must meet the existing dimensional requirements as required for an accessory structure. Well, I guess that it might be the 170 and 700. If that's, I don't know what they mean by that sentence. The minimum size, maximum size. I, yeah. I, but the first sentence is what disturbed it. How do we reconcile the first sentence of the rule seems to say it must be allowed on a lot regardless of whether the lot conforms to existing dimensional requirements. So if it's a grandfathered situation, if the house is on a, there's a house on a lot that's grandfathered. This seems to say, the rule seems to say that you can put an EDU on it. As long as you need. Which, which person is it moving to the line? The page nine of the DCD. Oh, okay. Um, I, I see, I mean, the draft, our draft, Makes perfect sense, except I don't think it changes anything again. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure it's supposed to change anything. I'm not criticizing it, but, but it says you can put an ADU in as long as you're not making things more non conforming. But aren't you always making things more non conforming when you're putting in more structure? Not, well, there is, there's some language around that. Um, So if we're talking about ADUs, um, if you go to page nine, um, which is the, the piece about accessory dwelling units that will be moved into our eight, um, And I wrote a piece that I was hoping would make that clear or clearer. Um, um, read uh, 2F. Two, two that was the intent of that paragraph, was to try to make that dimensional requirement piece clearer. You know, what part of the DECD rule are you looking at? It's, let's go back to the section. I'll get you the section number. It's, um, I, I'm on page nine in my draft, but I have to get back to the section number. This section's going forever. Four. Three. Do we ever get past three? Three. C. No, it is four. Um, four. Four B, four B, three D. What a ridiculous way to phrase it. These sections of phrase it. Four B, three D. Three B. Four B, three D. 
That's about. That's about motor vehicle parking. That's about parking. Oh. No, that I'm in the wrong place. It's page nine. It's. I see four. Okay, four with. So four C. Four C. Four C. Four C. Oh. I don't see four C. Yeah. No, it's four B, accessory dwelling units of section four of the rule. And um, under capital B requirements, subsections, subsection three, other, and then subdivision D. That's about parking. Okay. <laughs> so Peter, look at look at three A there. And that to me that makes it somewhat clear. It says a municipality must exempt an accessory dwelling unit from any density requirements or lot area requirements related to the area in which the accessory dwelling unit is constructed. So, um, so we, we can't apply density requirements or lot area requirements. I'm looking again at the, what page, what is page nine of my of this rule on the printout. Um, an accessory dwelling unit must be allowed on a lot um, regardless of whether the lot conforms to existing dimensional requirements. Um, but that's the grandfather right. edition. Uh, and uh, and it's sort of weird because the statute seems to know says well you can you can put an ADU into a grandfathered provision as long as it doesn't make it more non-conforming. That's so what the you're, statute. You're Twenty-five saying. feet from the lake, you can't make it twenty feet to the lake. Well, that's shoreland zoning. Yeah, that's clear. But, or, if the, but, or if the setback if the setback's twenty feet, you can't make it fifteen. Yeah, right. right. It's not limited to the shoreline zone. But if you were too close to the road, say, you're at 20 feet, you can extend the building out as long as you stay at that 20 feet. Right, right. Right. Not, even yeah. though the building's bigger, it's not more non conforming. Or like Correct. back away from the street, like behind the building. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So is there is there something in here that's 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 um, so causing you some heartburn, Peter? Um, well, let's put aside the rule, which I think I look at the statute seems pretty clear. An accessory dwelling unit under the statute is allowed on a lot that's, that that's, that does not conform. To the municipal zoning ordinance, if the accessory dwelling unit does not further increase the nonconformity, right? Yeah, um, and you know, and 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 we have a definition of increase in nonconformity in the ordinance, and there's a piece in the um, nonconformance chapter um, that also talks about increases in nonconformity. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty much, I mean, the situation that Don suggested, you know, if you've got something that's 20 feet from the water, you can't, you can't make it less than that. Um, we still have section D. Well, that's the drilling which shall be allowed under legal, non-controlling laws of record. 
provided for so long and meets all relevant requirements and standards set forth in Article 3 nonconformance of this ordinance. They do not result in increase of nonconformity. As I read it, I could be wrong, is that you can't consider that as nonconformity. That's taking away that from our statutes, our ordinance. You can't consider what nonconformity? And do not result in an increase in nonconformity. You know, I think what you're talking about is that issue that John brought up at the last meeting about references to nonconformity and and is it making a statement that a situation um, is not nonconforming or is it a directive? Um, and in this case, it is. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a directive. Maybe it needs to be worded differently. Yeah. But I think this is John's issue from last time. Um, Please forget and, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, where specifically are you reading, Chip? Um, Section twenty nine. Um, e. My reading of it was, I think, like John said, is that they're allowed to have these things. You've got to go along with setback requirements and all the relevant requirements, but it does not result. In, no, that's uh, not that's not what it means. That's not what it's supposed to mean. Um, <laughs> and this is this is that issue, John. I remember yeah. it burned in mm, my brain. Right. No, I, uh, I was I was I was convinced uh, at the last meeting that I was wrong. Um. <laughs> so the language. I mean, what it says is that that ADUs are allowed on these lots, mm -hmm. provided mm -hmm. they meet all relevant requirements and standards. And do not result in an increase in nonconformity. So I, if, think, <clears throat> I think what Peter's talking about though is uh any kind of a change to a nonconformity structure makes it more nonconforming. Traditionally, an expansion of a nonconforming structure increases the nonconformity. Mm -hmm. But I think the right. state, in so, this instance, what well, for ADUs under the state law now, and we're the mere fact that you build an ADU does not make it more nonconforming. Right. That's I right. Guess that's the point. Right. That's the right. Point. And, and I don't know. I have to say. I mean, I think that's we all agree on the intent, but the, the language here is a little confusing. It's proposed mm -hmm. um, because it says um, the expansion shall not make it more nonconforming. That could be. I, what are you reading from? This language. At the bottom of the yeah. in Article Three. Yeah. Three G M. Um, um we'll see okay, that and that mm -hmm. that's that's a piece that um I don't know if you're looking at the redraft with my proposed edits, but uh I am. Okay, what I suggested saying was an accessory dwelling unit is allowed within or attached to a non-conforming structure, provided it does not result in an increase in non-conformity. Oh, that's the later line. That's what I just sent out a right. few days ago. So if I go to this page, uh, Uh, I have, with the color contrast, I'm sorry, I just have a couple of it. But I'm sure that's better. That's better. Oh, are we on the subject of ADUs now? Um, well, we we um, we um, could be, um, and then come back to the rest of it. Um, no, we can go in order. That's fine. Oh, we. I did want to discuss your land use table. Okay, so um, all right, we just we just covered that change in the nonconformance article. Um, right. Uh, so we're on to 
the land use table at this point. Um, and um, so Jamal has added accessory dwelling unit to the table. And we had some conversation last time about um, code enforcement officer or planning board approval for those kinds of things. And um, Jack had pointed out, um, this was an offline conversation after that meeting. But Jack, why don't you why don't you talk about that footnote issue? Because it makes sense to me. But... Well, in Shoreland Residential, we require planning board review for every type of structure if it's within the setback area. So it would be odd to say we're exempting ADUs from that requirement when even an accessory like a, a shed requires planning board review. And you know, we just had this discussion about increase in nonconformity, which is always an issue in the shoreland zone. So I just feel like we should continue doing what we've done with every other structure in the shoreland residential and do the CP, you know, C slash P with the footnote requirement. So if it's in the setback zone, the planning board will, will review it. So if you look at that shoreland residential column, um, just about, you know, everywhere there is that footnote 11. And that's the, uh, the one that, that Jack is talking about that makes it clear that planning board review is needed if what they're proposing to build is in the in the setback. Mm -hmm. And if we put um, the C slash P with the footnote 11 there after accessory dwelling unit, um, it would make it consistent with the rest of the list. Yeah. So, um, if there's any discussion around that, um, would the planning board essentially just use the ordinance and just make sure that all the standards are met? That would that be the review? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But. Um, Number eleven on what you on what Jamel gave us or Paul you gave us is the wrong. It's not the same as our ordinance. I don't know. Something's happened with these footnotes. Yeah, so I only included the relevant sections that needed edits. So those footnotes are for the next table. If that makes uh, sense. Okay. So the footnotes for uh, the table we're looking at now. Um, table one, where the footnotes were not included in my draft because I didn't uh, change anything. Okay. Yep. So we could change that to C slash P and put the 11 there. The 11, yeah. yeah. It, should Unless... also, it should also be on the conversion of seasonal homes, right? I don't know. Well, there's a there's a footnote there. I'm not sure what it it, it uh, conversion oh. of seasonal homes. There's a seven there. I don't know what that oh, footnote yeah. is. That says C Article Eight Section Twenty Seven. Well, we don't need to deal with that. Oh, that that's the the whole performance standard for conversions of seasonal homes is what it is. So under what circumstances does the planning board review that conversion of seasonal homes if, if there's no number 11? Well, you know, it, it looks to me there's a C slash P there. It almost looks like the footnote was 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 left off and it should have been there. Right, that's what I think. Because that too. CP doesn't make any sense just as a standalone. Right. right. So we should probably do that as a correction.
Um, everybody comfortable with that? You know, adding that that eleven um, for accessory dwelling units. I mean, those are the ones that are going to be next to the lake, essentially. Um, I just, uh, Jack and I had a little email exchange about the issue of planning board review of these things. Uh, and I, he asked me to look at the law given, and I told him, yeah, I agreed with Jack that the guidance sent out by MMA in this regard was incorrect, which suggested that there was no role for the planning board here. Am I, am I stating this correctly, Jack? I agree with you that the play that the planning board could have a role. We could make the ordinance so the planning board could have a role. Right. Um. Okay, any more on that? Um, I think the next piece is um, uh, Jamel's series of footnotes on page six. And these are the ones that relate to the dimensional requirements, um, the, the dimensional uh, table. So he's added uh, 17 through 20. Um, and I'm suggesting a change to 17 beyond what is on the sheet. And um, uh, Jamel and I had talked about, about 17 um, because what I had done is to, I eliminated multifamily dwelling developments and inserted the new term affordable housing developments because we now have a definition for that. And the um, the other thing, when I looked at this in context, and Janelle, I didn't talk with you about this, but I'd be interested in what you think of this. I think that the footnote probably needs to say something like, um, except for affordable housing developments established in accordance with Title 30, et cetera, and Article 8, um, Section whatever of, of this ordinance. So the footnote sets up an exception um, rather than just, just referencing affordable housing developments. I think that that's fine, um, as long as it's, it's essentially just putting people on notice that there's a different density for affordable housing units. So however the board feels comfortable with stating that, um, I think accept is fine as well. I don't think it makes a difference. It's just, it's just a getting folks to look at the density bonus if they're doing affordable housing, if they start at the land use, at the dimensional table. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I inserted that clause after you and I talked, Jamel, I inserted that clause as well. Um, so it would be um, for those developments established in accordance with blah, 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 and um, are eligible for, for a density bonus. So to put that put that phrase in there because that is the situation. Um, I think that works. So Peter, are you good with the rest of those footnotes? That was your issue. I, I, no, no, my I um 
I'm fine with it. Uh, I have to say, um, I did look at all this, but uh, I got sort of uh, in the weeds to the point where I couldn't really, uh, on some of the footnotes, I couldn't read them. I'm having, a, I'm having a temporary, I hope, eye issue. So I'm, I would, I would, with magnify, with better light, I, I, at home, I can read them, but right now I can't. More lights weird than can't. Yeah, it's always weird. Oh, it's dark. There's another set but of lights. Is, that might help. Thank you, but it won't. It, oh, that does. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I have no problem. We have to start at the beginning. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Um, so uh, page seven, um, that's the one that should have just, um, all the new language should have been deleted because that gets moved into article eight. So it's already been incorporated um, um, elsewhere in article eight and the existing language for multifamily dwellings would appear in article eight. So that takes us to accessory dwelling units. Um, so this is um, kind of a mix um, of uh, Jamel's language and uh, some new language that I inserted. I rearranged some of these pieces. I was looking at you know what what seemed to me to be most important, some of the primary issues, and tried to put those at the top of the list. So it is rearranged to some extent from the earlier draft. Some of the language is a little bit different, um, but I I think, um, and I think you told me, Jamel, that this captures everything that you thought needed to be in there. And I've, I've added a, a few things. Um, for instance, I added the piece about um, in H um, about potable water and the wastewater disposal system. That's directly from the rule. Um, and um, I wrote F, um, specifically thinking about this whole matter of the dimensional requirements and which ones they're subject to and which ones they aren't. And um, um, so that was the purpose of that. I wanted to ask a policy question. I think I asked it at the last meeting, but the requirement that the owner occupy the uh, single family dwelling or the accessory dwelling unit, I'm not sure why, why we're doing that. And it seems that it's going to lead to a lot of disputes because somebody will have their mother-in-law in the accessory dwelling unit and they go to Florida for six months of the year. And then what does the mother-in-law do? Does she have to move out because the, the son has moved to Florida for six months? And I'm not sure what it accomplishes by. But saying, that is a required uh, piece, if I remember correctly. I don't think so. Required by the law or the rule? Do you remember it now? I, I um, don't think it's a requirement. The the occupancy. I think that that's just uh, a lot of communities do that, um, but I don't think it's required. So you would you had suggested that from the beginning. Um, yep. And that's that's, just, that's based off. That's just based off all the other smaller main communities, especially late communities. They um, pretty much all of them have, have this provision, but it's it's not a requirement. So we started there um, with with Reedfield. Okay. Um, I think the concern in other towns is um, like short term rentals and stuff like that. 
which could be dealt with separately. Mm -hmm. if we but, you know, if the goal is to create like additional housing units of different, you know, for different sorts of population, but then when you tie it to somebody being there year round or their local residents, it, it gets, we just see a lot of disputes or a lot of gray area. And I'm not sure what we get out of it. Um, so how, how would you limit it, Jack? I mean, you know, if you leave it wide open, um, it seems like it's just a, you know, an open invitation for somebody to build a rental unit in the backyard. I mean, it would have to meet the, the limit on size, but yeah, I mean, isn't that part of the goal? I think so. Well, is to. I mean, what does it matter if they build a rental unit? I mean, they if they uh, if they occupy the, one of the buildings, if the owner occupies one of the buildings, they can they can make the ADU a rental unit if they want. And so, why does it matter whether they're they're year round or or five months of the year? I don't think that necessarily matters. Um, what, what's the language that you had put in, Jamel, was about um, what is it? Primary, primary residence doesn't say year round. Legal residence, legal residence, something which we'd have to define. I but, think that's usually over like if you like one hundred and eighty one days. Right, that's Generally. what the state tax code is. But what would we do if somebody had a, you know, in the shoreland zone, they had an ADU that they had their son living in, and then they, the parents go to Florida for six months, 181 days. Would the son have to move out? <laughs> yeah, Chip, you have to break the news. <laughs> that was crazy. I mean... The DECD rule at this time, I'm sure it's section four, <laughs> section four B two A simply says at least one accessory dwelling unit must be allowed on any lot where a single family dwelling unit is the principal structure. It says nothing about owner occupied. Yeah, and Jamel said that it was not a requirement, but most of the towns he's worked with have put limitations. So that's where he started, was with that limitation in the draft. So uh, are, are you um, um, are you suggesting um, <clears throat> no limitation? Just leave it wide open? Yeah, unless there's a good reason for it. I mean, does having the owner there make a difference? I think what the legislature was trying to do was to stop people from renting out their houses and their dwelling units for income. And that was, you know, that's a restrictive way to you know, stop it, you know, so you can't do that when they're not saying it. Well, it says the purpose of the section is to encourage diversity in housing, including allowing people to get rental income, right? And companionship, security, and services. I mean, if people so have a problem, Short-term rentals, we could deal with that, but that hasn't been an issue in Reefville, I don't think. Does that mean you think it has been? I don't it's a problem, but it exists. Yeah. It's prolific in the summertime. So, Jamel, I mean that that strikes me as probably the 
I mean, that, is that the principal issue that other towns have tried to address through putting restrictions on the ADUs is the short-term rental question? Um, some have, some have put like specific timelines that they can be rented um, as well in the ordinance. Like no, no less than um, like 60 days or whatever for a rental, for example. But I'm not sure that we want to go down that road right here. I mean, unless, you know, it's like a dire situation. Um, but that's why the owner occupancy uh, provision has been in the ordinances is to just, is for that reason. But it's definitely not a requirement. So what's everybody else think about that? I think we'd agreed last time we didn't want, at least at this point in time, to go down the short-term rental road. Um, um, so we won't do that, but we do have this question in front of us now. Do we put any restrictions on the ADUs in terms of occupancy or just leave it open as Jack is suggesting? Well, I would uh, go with Jack's approach. I think there are a host of potential enforcement problems if we try to limit it to owner-occupied properties. <clears throat> what if it had to be owner-occupied at time of construction of the ADU? Well, it would stall. <clears throat> people from just buying the house, slapping up an ADU for the purpose of having two rental properties yeah. in a town they don't intend on living in. Yeah. And that that's the that's the issue that I, I see that potentially. But if you had to live in it when you build the ADU, and then if you turn around and sell them both or whatever, that's a whole different ballgame. But can we Yeah, if we don't do anything, I I I agree with Brandon. I I think the potential is there for somebody to come into Reedfield, buy a house on the lake, build the ADU, um, with the intent of having two rental properties on the lake instead of one. We're talking just about the lake. Or, well, it could be anywhere. Well, it could be yeah, anywhere, right. but I mean, that's the most likely, right. you know. You could quickly have a neighborhood of six houses that has 12 houses. More houses. Yeah, but not for summer vacations. Right. That's not what they're promoting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it means, it means, I feel like the way it is here really does do a better job of capturing the spirit of what the legislation is all about. With the yeah. owner occupancy yeah. requirement? Yeah. Um, but well, I, can see, I understand some of the issues that go with that, so. I haven't got answers to that. Jamal, are there any other approaches that other towns may have taken short of, you know, the somewhere in the middle of what we're talking about here? Not the strict owner occupancy requirement, but not leaving the door wide open to somebody swooping in with the intent of creating some rental units. Not in my experience with LD2003. I could ask at the office um, what other folks have experienced, but for me, it's been one or the other. Um, but I'm happy to do a little digging on that one. Could you say that the um, that the legal the legal owner of the property has to reside and has to no, never mind. 
Uh, what Brandon was suggesting as an alternative potentially was requiring that the owner reside in the primary home mm -hmm. at the time the ADU is built. Yeah. And then it wouldn't matter after that. Like they could sell it. That's what I was thinking. That seems like a middle of the road approach. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I guess I don't really understand the the rental and or short term rental market in Reedfield. Um, I have to learn about that a little more to like make a good decision um, from from that. But I, I guess that would be like that's a a, a fine compromise, I would say. So people wouldn't be specifically building them just for rentals. That's what you're, that would be the goal of that, right? Right. The goal would be to not have two rental properties. Mm -hmm. Basically. Right. You're still going to rent your ADU, but your primary residence. Right. Yeah. And initially, they could initially. sell it. Of course, and then there, you know, theoretically, there could be. I guess there could be two rental properties. I believe it could be true. Or you yeah. could, you could say that only one of the units can be a rental unit. So well, it no, it 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 that it it avoids. I think it avoids the problem that Jack pointed out earlier about you know somebody the hundred and eighty one days and you know if they go to Florida, um, um, so they could still go to Florida um, for one hundred and eighty two days, and as long as it's not a rental unit, they'd be okay. And then you wouldn't worry about the length of their residency in that in that dwelling. <clears throat> and Jamal, do you think that is a reasonable approach? Um, I I'm having a hard time um, saying either way on the spot. I like yeah. to usually think about things um, a little bit, but so the idea would be that you can only have one unit for rent. That that's right. the proposal. You know, okay. Yeah, I guess I would ask Chip. You know, like, without knocking on doors, is is that enforceable from a code officer? perspective more more enforceable than it's a matter of getting a flag jacket what's that i didn't hear you it's time constraints so jack your your comment was that it's more enforceable than the residency requirement right Okay, so there's. I'd be okay with going that one. That route. Only one rental. One of the units is, is rental. I mean, I think the way people. You're going to hear about these things is because the neighbors are going to rat on. It's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. There are people now that have parcels with two families. What's going to happen to them? Are they grandfather? I would think so. Um, you know, anything that's before zoning. Yeah. I, 
I was I think there are probably more rented houses around here than than we could possibly know. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um my uh, kids' daycare provider years and years ago lived in a nice house on Peter Ridge Road, and I had no idea years later it was rented until they had a problem right. <laughs> with their landlord. I think Brandon's solution is clear. If, if you're gonna have a compromise that you start out with if you want, I don't personally as again, I don't see any reason to limit it, but if we're gonna limit it. The better limit is to say that it's owner that the ADU be built at a time when there's an owner occupied primary structure. And just leave it at that, that not get into whether it's what's rental and what isn't rent. Is it being rented? It just seems fairly simple. They come to you for a permit. And if they don't live there, they don't get a permit. Instead of you chasing around trying to figure out if they rent the house or the garage or both, or now you got to evict somebody. That'll be a good time. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but that is at the time of the permit, would be when we find out. Or as you said, there are neighbors like, what's going on over there? Not that that ever happens. <laughs> So let's everybody think about that, um, that the primary structure is occupied by the owner at the time the ADU is built. That's kind of what's on the table presently. Is there comfort with that or you feel you need to add something more to it? Okay, it's okay with me. John, you're shaking your head. That's I, it. Yeah, I think it's, it makes sense to me. I, I think that what what we're what we um as Jack said, you know, what we're kind of getting into here is short term rentals. That whole that whole issue, and we're not wanting to get into that right now. So this is this is something I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Uh, before we, at some point, try to tackle the whole short-term rental issue. Hey, Tom, are you? Yeah, I can live with that. Mm -hmm. You'd you'd prefer to take another? I mean, I think I I like the the only one rental because I think it's going to prevent problems down the road. But yeah, I think for for now, just going with the owner occupancy at some time of the that's okay. Peter, you're yeah. okay with that? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. We'll replace the owner occupancy with that. You could also um, delete the transfer language as well at that point that we drafted. No, transfer yeah. Property. Yeah. Yeah. I had another question about ADUs. It talks about in the introductory part about them being residential in appearance. Is that is that a standard though? Or is that just a kind of general policy statement, but not enforceable? Jack, where am I looking? Um, page nine, last... section 29. Okay. Introductory paragraph G. And it says, and it's describing ADUs, and it says the single family residential appearance of the property. Father. I guess. I guess I mean that language suggests to me it says um, um, you know developing these these units and single family neighborhoods and 
And it goes on to talk about, um, you know, all these things you're trying to protect and maintain. Um, and the suggestion in that language to me is that that will happen if you construct or establish these units in accordance with the conditions of the section. I mean, that's that right. seems to be its purpose. Jamel, did that is that language that was developed for other towns or did that where did that come from? Yeah, I think this came from a number of other communities, ADU um, ordinances. Um, you can take it out if you don't feel strongly about uh, resident single family residential appearance, but I think the idea is that they don't have a, a major impact on residential neighborhoods. So they're just you know they're there but they're not super noticeable I mean, we don't have a standard for or a condition that they be residential in appearance i don't know what that is exactly but... i know you didn't like the mma guide as well as like they had once i just did an ai on and this one section kind of struck the chord. Affordable housing law apply, apply to short-term rentals. The municipalities have the authority to regulate short-term rentals as a way to achieve housing production goals. Regulations can include defining and regulating short-term rentals as commercial uses, transient housing, restricting their location, and imposes more stringent dimensional requirements for licensing ordinances. So they're basically saying that you can do what you're talking about. It's going to be enforceable. It's going to be. They're talking about short-term rentals, though. Right. <clears throat> Under affordable housing. But we're talking about accessory dwellings. Forgive me. I just, I, you know, I, I didn't see the point of the purpose statement. For uh, the ADUs, ADU, the law is the law, though they permitted ADUs under certain circumstances. Um, and it's, uh, I don't really understand what message this paragraph is supposed to send. Yeah, it is, you know, looking at it again, it is kind of an odd thing. We don't do that. Um, it's supposed to make me deal with it. <laughs> I don't think we have to worry. We don't have the kind of worry that maybe they have in Falmouth that somehow we can be overrun by commercial establishments into the the residential neighborhoods. And what's everybody else think? I'd be good with taking it out. I don't know that it gives us anything that we don't already have. John, Jack, John. I I think we should take it out because it's just verbiage. It's not enforceable. Um, somebody, somebody, some, somebody might think you know. Uh, that you know, a warehouse looking thing, it does look good as a residence or something. It, then we would but put a standard in that it be residential in appearance, which I think we have for variances or something. I mean, we could we could add we could add a standard. To this list and say that. Say what? Um, say that it's um, ADUs have to be have to look like houses and not warehouses. <laughs> Jack, Jack can figure out how to say it. Seems John's idea. 
<laughs> I mean, it seems unlikely. I mean, they're little, first of all. I mean, they're 190 to 700 square feet, so they're not very big. And, and they can only be built in association with a primary residence. I don't know. I don't know how you're going to be able to define something like that anyway. So I was, I was actually speaking in jest. I, I'm not really thinking that we should do this either. So are you comfortable taking out the purpose state? Okay. Yes. Jack? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get rid of it. Okay. What else about ADUs? Anything else? Anybody? Okay. Um, so that takes us to the last piece, which is definitions. And we talked a little bit about these um, already. So we have a new definition of accessory dwelling unit and uh, that second sentence, um, I added that um, because it struck me as one of those things that we might need to have at some point in the future. Um, so the accessory dwelling unit definition is a self-contained dwelling unit, et cetera. And I just had visions of someone, you know, challenging, what does that mean? What does self-contained mean? This sentence, the second sentence that I inserted came from the city of Augusta's ordinance um, when they were looking to do their LD 2003 update. And it seemed useful to me, so I included that. And then um, the definition of affordable housing development, we talked a little bit about that already. And that's it. One thing that um, and, and back a, an hour ago, Peter mentioned something about uh, the term, I think he, he used uh, enforceable co covenant. And I'm just wondering. Oh, change that. I mean, it's, it's part of the, the fee law and the rule DECD rule both say restrictive covenants. Uh, and I, so we can't be careful with that. I, I just, my comment was, the term restrictive covenants has this long, this long ago usage in law about keeping out people who are in some religion or race. And I, so I don't like the use of the term here. I wish they'd used a different term, that's all. Oh, I in see. The law. I see. Yeah. And Jamel, anything else that occurs to you that we might not have touched on? No, I think the second sentence an accessory dwelling unit definition is really good. Um, and I also like the affordable housing development definition. Um, I have a bunch of scribble and changes, so I don't know if maybe we could touch base after the meeting or at some point soon, Paula, to discuss. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch okay. of to do's and I just want to, um, we can talk about it. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, good discussion. I think that we ended up in a good place. Um, thanks for all of your work, Paula, for helping out with all the drafting. No, thank thank you for spending all the time that you did on it. It's been very helpful. So thank you. Um, at this point, we're on kind of a fast track. Um, 
we need to get this thing to hearing, but before we can do that, we, I mean, obviously there are a number of changes from tonight's discussion. Um, we also need to produce a, you know, a legislative draft with underlying strikeout uh, prior to the hearing. And uh, Jamel, that, that you said that that North Star could do that for us. Is that something that could be fairly quick? Um, yeah, we could. Do you have any sense of do, timing? We could do a um, like a clean. What we usually do for towns is a strike through version and a clean version, as if it were passed. So yeah. folks can. Sometimes when people read the strike through, they like they can't deal with it. So we just provide. Right, right. And we we usually do both as well. Uh, you know, okay. Yeah, so available. we could do that. Um, but we'd like I'd like to discuss the changes and who's going to do those. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, because I feel like all that should be done before we go ahead and do the final. Yeah, definitely. Strike definitely. But yeah, we're, um, we're available to do that. Okay. Um. I'm I'm a little concerned that we're not going to make it to a hearing on the twelfth. The twelfth is a week from tonight. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. It, it's not a week from tonight. It's a week. Um, um, we would have to. I'm thinking about the notice. The notice requirement, which is a minimum of thirteen days before the hearing. So. That's what I'm thinking about specifically in terms of, of the 12th. And that notice would have to be posted a week from tonight to meet the 13 days. And I don't think we're going to be ready to do that. Uh, we've got to have this clean draft. Um, and so one of the options I was going to put on the table and see if it's workable is um, the possibility of pushing the hearing out one more week to the 19th, which is not a regular meeting date. Um, we need the next hearing. We have two applicants. Now I'm talking about the hearing. I, I'm just and talking about the well. I, I know that- Because we know, canceled two meetings for one meeting. This right, week. right, right. And we've got that other stuff. Right. But all I'm saying is I don't, I, I'm concerned that we're not going to be ready That's fine. to we'll take the LUO to, to the hearing. Yeah. Um, so um, what would that look like for everybody? I mean, if we did the hearing on the 19th. So two weeks. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had a to be away, but I can. I didn't have to be away. But yeah, could you? Would you resume with us? Uh, no, if I were, I, I'd be here either in this room or far away. <laughs> you can join us with a mic guy. <laughs> right, if I were visiting people, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to yeah. carry my laptop. And, you know, I, I certainly don't know what to expect from a hearing, but just based on, you know, history and and hearings, having to do with ordinance revisions. They've not been um, particularly well attended. Um, we may wind up with no one. I would hate for you to cancel your plans. Yeah, right I, I have no firm plans, so just, you shouldn't do it. But everybody else, is the 19th a possibility? Works for John, me. Jack, okay. Yep. Um, yeah, the 13 day notice requirement is is the concern and the notice would have to be posted next Wednesday and that just seems really way too tight to me to get the, the draft, you know, the cleaned up draft finished, circulated so everybody can take another look at it. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned about that. So, you know, I think we're still okay in terms of the time. Uh, time frame for the town stuff, the warrant articles and so forth. Um, and if we do it on the 19th. What I will say it? that um, North Star will not be able to attend on the 19th, but I'm not sure that we need to. 
Yeah, you probably, um, yeah, you're going to be away and it probably sure. isn't necessary. I, I'd be surprised if we got a lot, but we'll all take, well, I'll take good notes. If we have a hundred people turn up, we'll it isn't going to we'll happen. Yeah. 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 I'll be away and there's, uh, I think we have three or four other meetings. So our entire staff will be in different towns. Then it's a bad night. <laughs> for or a great night depending on how you look at it but yeah that i don't i'm not i think that you guys will be fine without without our support so just wanted to throw that out there okay um all right all that being said why don't we tentatively plan on the 19th and we'll see when you know when we get the draft in the end and um and as chip mentioned uh he's got a couple of things pending so we're likely going to have to do the regular meeting on the 12th, too. Absolutely. And um, we'll do the 19th instead of the 26th. Um, or you could do the 26th as well, but that would be three in a row. And I won't be here on the 26th. We put off the uh, Quiet Harbor hearing since November. And the other one that's coming in has been trying since beginning of January, and that is the the new tenant for the pot shop. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll do those on the twelfth. Do great. the LUO hearing on the nineteenth. Okay. okay. Would you want to put a note on the um, announcements or website? Website then. Mm -hmm. Something about the LUO might be discussed uh, under work session or something, so you can discuss it if you need to. You don't have to for for the twelfth. For the twelfth, in case there's something that oh. the board has to discuss as a whole, um, it has to be noticed. So I'm just saying that I want to put under the work session, sure. possibly possible yep. discussion. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, anything else on that? Everybody okay with those dates and the schedule? Okay. All right. Um, so Jamel and I will talk about those changes and we'll look to North Star to get the, um, uh, the finished draft. Um, and I can talk to you about the timing on that, Jamal, but um, obviously the you know the sooner the better. <laughs> but uh, we can talk about the changes and and so forth. Sounds um, good. I'm, I'm working the next few days, so um, we can schedule a time. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think we just have minutes left. So thank you very much, Jamal. And uh, yeah, thanks, guys. You've been great. Appreciate it. Okay, I'll be talking to you. Yep, Thanks. have a good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thanks, Jamal. So we have a set of minutes from the last meeting, which was the 20th, 30th, I think it's, there it is. Yeah, January 30th. And um, um, I, I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot, but um, I did have uh, one minor comment about the next to the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, it says the board agree that any ADU applications in the Sugarland zone will come to the planning board until the proposed changes are ironed out. Um, I would suggest alternatively, um, because this was mentioned up above as well, um, and uh, because we did talk about it twice that night. Yeah. And we said something slightly different the second time than the first time. So. What I'd suggest is saying, upon further discussion, comma, the board agreed that any ADU applications in the shoreland zone 
will come to the planning board for discussion during initial implementation of the new LUO provisions. And that is different still from what we agreed tonight. <laughs> but that accurately captures what we talked about at the last meeting. So. Okay. Um, any other edits, anyone? If not, um, we're ready for a motion on the minutes of January 30th. I'll move we adopt the minutes as amended. There's second. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? John? Yes. I need a voice. <laughs> Jack? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that is it. Unless anyone has anything else. I like Jack's artwork. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We're adjourned. No, it, it's apparently left over. Somebody oh, thank you. I don't know. Pretty close to that mind. As long as it's in mind, that's probably.